Okay, so um, yeah, I, I thought uh, when I was asked to, or invited to speak here today, I was, um, I was really happy because um, I feel that uh, scientists, uh, myself included, don't take enough time out to think about the profession and uh, how to be happy in it. Um, and um, I thought to talk a bit about my blog because uh, I do spend a lot of time on it and, um, and I discuss various issues of scientific integrity and other things, but a lot of it's depressing, so I thought I'd do something else. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, having listened to all the talks today, um, uh, there seems to be a competition on imposter syndrome. I'm the only one who made two slides this morning, so I think I, I win in terms of imposter. Four. Okay, well, there you go. Um, there you go. Okay, I thought I could win. Um, so I, I thought a lot about, um, you know, my, my own career and. Um, well, is there any unifying ideas or, or a principle behind that I've learned? Um, uh, and I, I thought I came up with one which I'd share with you um, uh, due to Abram Wald, uh, which uh, is a very simple thing, but actually maybe not so simple as well, and um, thought I'd discuss it. So um, this goes back to, uh, uh, well, actually, this is an anecdote or a story I, I, I didn't know, and I learned recently from a book by a mathematician. Uh, called Jordan Ellenberg. It's uh, something like how to not be wrong or how not to be wrong. It's a great math book uh, for the general public. Um, and it, it, it has a story in the beginning um, about, uh, well, about uh, Abraham Wald, who uh, was a mathematician, statistician, uh, lived from early part of the 20th century to about 1950. And he, um, in, in World War II, he was, uh, uh, he was called upon to help with uh, a challenge of the Air Force, which was to design better armor for aircraft. So the idea was that, you know, all these planes were going out and coming back with bullet holes. And um, there was a project afoot to try to figure out, you know, looking at the bullet holes, where the armor wasn't very strong, and to try to collect data. This is big data, World War II. Uh, collect data, figure out where the bullet holes pierce the, uh, pierce the body of the plane, and put more armor on it. Um, and Rob, like looked at the data, uh, which looked something like this, and he immediately answered that the engine should be protected, um, which was the one area where there were no bullet holes. Okay. Um, and because he realized right away that what was happening was that the aircraft who were being shot in the engine weren't coming home. So uh, that's where you want to protect the aircraft, not where you see the most bullet holes, but where you see none at all. And it's a sort of nice story because um, it's sort of a keen insight um, that has nothing really to do with aircraft or bullet holes. It's the kind of thing a mathematician might see in a problem like this. Um, and I think there's sort of some depth to this observation. Um, and it's sort of a canonical example of what you might call selection bias. And, you know, thinking about it, my life as an academic and my path to being where I am today, um, I basically uh, think there's just over and over uh, instances of selection bias in everything I do and, and everything that got me here. So I thought I'd discuss that a bit today and give a few examples. Um, one that comes up a lot just talking about um, uh, you know published research, actually I don't need this, it's fine, um, is you know, everything that's published in science is, uh, is a success. Um, we, people rarely or, or hardly at all publish their failures. Um, and that's come to be very personal for me in the last few years. I, I, I was trained in mathematics, but I've now been in jointly in the biology department for a few years here, and I, I have a lab now. And uh, we've had this lab running for three or four years. I think we're on the verge of our first successful experiment. Um, uh, not for lack of trying, it turns out to be very hard, I found out, you know, to do experiments, who, who knew? Um, so I think that's a real problem. Um, similarly, you know, uh, thinking about this event, you know, often those who dispense advice or um, the professors we learn from the mentors we have uh, are those who succeeded. And uh, you don't hear from those who failed. Um, actually, it's much more complicated than that. Um, you know, it, one of the things I think, uh, being negative for a second, was horrible for me looking back about growing up in science is that, the, and I think it's true today, there's a very strong sense that success means um, in academia to become a tenured professor, ideally at a, 
highly ranked university. Um, actually, one of the speakers earlier was talking about scientific outreach and called that an alternative career, but really it's a completely legitimate, reasonable career. Actually, the alternative is becoming a tenured professor because very few people actually do that. Um, the mainstream of graduate students that come through a place like UC Berkeley, including my own students, go on, for example, to industry, where they do a lot of great science. Um, it's perfectly legitimate scientific career, but inside academia, um, though you don't hear from people like that very often. You know, maybe occasionally at events like this or elsewhere, but by and large, it's just academics who are tenured professors, um, mostly white males, dispensing advice about how great it is and how they become successful. Um, Similarly, you know, elected laws, uh, you know, elected officials passing laws are exactly those officials who success, you know, succeed in being elected. Um, uh, so this kind of idea of selection bias transcends just scientific discourse, but is an issue more generally. And since politics came up today, I thought I'd give this picture there from last week. There's selection bias uh, in, in the making. You have um, a bunch of white guys talking about maternity care. Uh, because they got elected, um, they're making the decisions. Um, so maybe that's not such a good thing. And also maybe something one should be aware of. So, you know, underlying um, this selection bias is a really basic formula in statistics, one which I've used my whole career, but which I have found is actually quite subtle and complicated. Um, formula is simple, uh, it's called Bayes' rule. Um, but I've returned to it over and over throughout my career, always seemingly returning to the same place and understanding something new. Um, so this formula re relates conditional probabilities where you have events A and B, and you might be interested in how you know, the probability of A given that B happened and understanding that in relation to B given that A happened. So, okay, it's a formula. Um, let me say a word about how it relates to the bullet holes in the engines. What the Army or Air Force was measuring um, was, you know, given that they saw planes with bullet holes coming back, so they saw bullet holes, they're trying to figure out what does that mean about the armor on the engine or the wing flap or the tail. So PB given A is sort of what's being measured. Um, of course, there's a general probability for the engine being hit versus the wing or some other part of the aircraft. And you can think of Abraham Wald's insight was to realize that when they're shooting at the planes from the ground, they're not particularly more liable to hit the engine or the wing or any other part of the aircraft. Maybe it's a bit harder to hit the very top of the aircraft, but generally they're just shooting all over the aircraft. So that these probabilities are kind of uniform. Um, and basically, what you're really interested in is to know if the engine was hit, you know, would there be a bullet hole there? And, you know, basically the answer is no, the answer is zero. You know, if the engine's hit, you're not going to see a bullet hole because the whole plane crashes. Um, so really what he was doing in his head, with the selection bias that he was noting there, what he was really fluent with was Bayes' rule. And becoming fluent with Bayes' rule, I feel, is sort of a basic life skill um, that would serve one well in grad school and in postdoc. Uh, just thinking about that in terms of what's going on in one's career. Um, just to give an idea of you know, how subtle Bayes' rule can be, because formula looks kind of simple, but this is an example that I uh, uh, developed for a course here for freshman students. Um, we, we developed this in the math department, sort of a course on stats um, alongside calculus to replace just the calculus sequence for biology majors. And we have this example, it's a very standard example in, in, when teaching Bayesian, uh, Bayes' rule, um, is that when you go out and test for rare diseases, um, you might have a test that's correct 99% of the time when you give it to somebody with a disease, that right? is to say 99% of the time you'll identify that that person is sick with the disease. Um, and 99.5% of the time when somebody doesn't have the disease. So if somebody's healthy and you do the test, Almost always, you note know that they're actually healthy. But because the disease is rare, if you, um, you, know, you, you get this sort of non-intuitive result, which is that if you want to, you, know, you, you test positive and you'd like to know, does somebody have the disease? 
um, turns out that the probability is actually quite low. So with those numbers I just showed you, and here's all the math. Don't worry, I won't make you do it. Um, turns out only 0.2% of the people who test positive actually have the disease. So if you go back and look at these numbers, you know, it's not intuitive, right? The test seems very accurate. 99% you know, sensitive, 99.5% specific. But the disease being rare uh, causes you to have uh, a very low probability of actually having the disease, even though you tested positive. And actually, I don't have time today to go into it, but this relates to a lot of what I do on my blog, because you can understand a lot of sort of the lack of reproducibility in science um, you know, in terms of this kind of very simple math. You know, people often do a test and they compute a p-value, uh, but really, uh, they're, what they're really trying to do is look for the truth. Truth, you know, look for effects that are rare, and the same kind of issue crops up. And if you look at, I mean, again, I won't go through all the math, but we we're trying to figure out, you know, you got a positive result, are you sick? Um, turns out to be related to, you know, if you're sick, where you get a positive result? And so that's how, you know, the, this uh, Bayes rule is flipping around the conditional probabilities. Okay, so the point here is that a Bayes rule is not always intuitive, and um, it's easy to fool people with that. Um, it's also useful to think about Bayes rule in terms of yourself. So here's an example. So, um, you, you know, people talk about privilege. And this is a new thing. It's got, like everybody talks about privilege, and you know, and there's sort of two camps, right? There's the people who think that it's very unfair that some people have privilege, um, and then there's the other folks who say, well, you know, I don't know. I had a hard time in my life, so what if I'm a white male guy? Um, but again, you know, it's sort of the same uh, trick going on here to really understand actually privilege. I think you need to understand Bayes' rule. Um, you're kind of asking, you know, what's the probability that I'll have a successful life, given that I had privilege? You know, that's the calculation you're trying to do. Um, and that relates to, you know, uh, given that you had success, are you somebody with privilege? And, you know, you look around and you, you measure people who've had success, quote unquote. Let's say you're looking at tenured faculty in our math department here on campus. Um, by and large, all people with privilege. So those probabilities are very high. Um, and what you're really trying to do is invert Bayes' rule. But to do that, you need to understand the overall rates of privilege, the overall rates of success, some of which are very low numbers. And only that way can you sort of make sense of this calculation. So I think that's one reason, actually, people get in fisticuffs over this sort of thing, because it's actually quite complicated to make sense of it. It's not as simple as saying, you know, privilege yields success, or success yields privilege, or the other way around. Um, uh, same with career choice, you know, when you're thinking about career choice, what you're really interested in is, you know, given some advice, will that lead me to success? That's what people are trying to sell you all the time. Um, but the, the data that you're looking at is, you know, did the people who had success, you know, what, what advice did they follow? That's what they're telling you. So you're trying to invert this. So every time it's an inversion, they can have a non-obvious and non-intuitive result. So I thought I'd give you um, uh, an example. You know, so I've been facing this kind of uh, issue my whole career and thinking about these things. But you know, about two or three years ago, um, this very simple, subtle base rule kind of thing came up in my research. Um, so I wanted to make the point that um, I really do think this is sort of a fundamental principle to think about. Um, it came up in a study uh, looking at a methylation of DNA. Uh, another kind of popular hot topic right now to talk about is epigenetics and the idea that it's not just our DNA um, that maybe affects, our, uh, uh, maybe affects us, but maybe what we actually do during our lifetime, like smoke or eat beef, might change our epigenetics and maybe that's inheritable uh, uh, so, or heritable. And so uh, there's lots of, you know, fun, popular science about this. A lot of it rubbish, but anyway. Um, we are studying methylation. And basically, methylation is a chemical modification on DNA. It's one type of epigenetic mark. And it's known that these sort of chemical modifications on DNA 
depend on the, you know, which kind of cell the DNA is in, methylation states may change over time, and occasionally they may be inherited in certain ways. And so um, one of the things we do in my group is study this phenomenon um, and develop methodology, not methods, but methodology uh, for it, um, and, uh, and, uh, and just try to understand the effect. And uh, we were looking at some literature um, that was looking at methylation patterns um, in genes and their relationship to splicing. And so um, what that means is that your know, genes um, you know, have really are just sort of regions in the DNA. They have some structure. They usually have a part in front of the gene called a promoter, which contains sequences that drive the gene being uh, expressed or turned on. Um, the genes themselves have a structure which consists of things called exons and introns. Um, this is just a cartoon for the sequence here. Um, after transcription, where the DNA uh, is copied into RNA, um, there is a step where the sort of copy template uh, has these introns excised, and the purple bits are glued together. This is called splicing to make the actual uh, gene, that, you know, uh, product that's then translated into protein, and this methylation, which is again, remember, a chemical modification of this DNA. Um, well, there's been you know, various hints in the literature that it's involved in this process of splicing, and that, that may be important um, in various diseases and for various kinds of functions of the cell. So it's something people are studying a lot of. Um, and I've noted here that um, you know, there's lots of connections also to cancer and other diseases. And people were making plots like this all over the literature. We actually found a few dozen papers like this where they noted that where you have a junction between a part of the DNA that's going to later get excised as RNA and an exon that will go on to make protein, that there's an overall higher rate of methylation in the exons, which is sort of interesting. You know, why would there be a higher rate of methylation? Well, that's an interesting question you might ask, and maybe that hints at some function of the methylation uh, in terms of its connection to splicing and expression and so on. These plots are really simple. There's just measurements made across lots of different genes. At each site, you go and you measure the, you know, the number of methylated cytosines. What this means here, methylation affects the C. Um, it happens at CGs, so you know, where you have a C followed by a G. Uh, the C may or may not be methylated, and you count the number where the C is methylated versus the number it's not, and that's how the people made these plots. Um, so that's what I'm showing here. You just take lots and lots of these regions, and you just average. Um, now, what happens when you do this averaging is that uh, if you look at a specific gene, you may have a site where you just don't have a CG, so I put an X for those, because you just can't get a measurement there. It's missing data. Or you might have a site where you do have a CG, in which case there are two options. Either it's methylated or not methylated. That would be 0 and 1. So you get kind of data where, in some cases, you simply have missing uh, data with an X because there was no CG. And then you just average over each of the columns over where you did collect your data. And because I started with the bullets in the aircraft, if you're sort of paying attention, that you may be reminded of that case where there was kind of missing data in the engine. And it turns out that's exactly what's going on here. So I'll show you in a second. So if you have a matrix, like I just made here, uh, you know, just a table of numbers like this uh, with zeros and ones, what we're doing is kind of figuring out the averages of the columns. And well, if you have a, if you have a table and you fill it with numbers, uh, it's not hard to see that if you calculate the averages in the columns and the averages on the rows, and you average those averages, you get the same thing. So you know, if I take the average of 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, you know, I get the same as if I take these averages. Rows and columns don't matter. But if you have missing data, if I just black out some of the boxes here, and I calculate the averages this way and the averages that way, they may be unequal and different from the total average of all the numbers in the table. All right. And that's just how it is. All right. um, 
And so it turns out that that is affecting the calculation here because what you're doing in these tables is you're calculating the column averages, um, but those may be different than the row averages, which are the sort of the average amount of methylation across each intron or exon. And so you may get pictures like this, even though if you look at a specific row, that is a specific, you know, single gene, there is no excess uh, methylation rate one way or the other. And you can see that right here. So in each of the genes, if I take this gene, for example, it's 100% methylated in the intron, and it's 100% methylated in the exon. And that's true for every single one. Yet, when I look at the column averages, it appears to me that the intron is um, less methylated than the exon. Okay? And that's because of the, the row on top. So every single gene is exactly the same in its introns and exons, but this plot makes it look flipped. It's a pretty subtle effect. Right? So what's going on here is called Simpson's paradox. And it's very closely related to what I was just talking about before. Um, just check the time, make sure I don't go too far over. Um, it's a really kind of just happens to be a um, historical accident that it was popularized in an article in Science in the late 70s by a professor of statistics here, Peter Bickel, in relationship to Berkeley admission numbers. There are, he was asked to investigate potential bias in Berkeley admission rates where men um, seem to have higher admission rates than women. And it turns out that if you look at the actual division of admission rates by department, this is actual data from 1973, what you'll see is that, uh, so these departments are labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, you'll see that actually in not all but most departments, there actually is a higher rate of admissions of women in the department. This is, it's, it's confusing. You know, I told you all this conditional probability, it messes with you. So on average, the admission rates are higher for men, but by department, it's actually reversed. And, you know, that doesn't mean that the departments are admitting fairly by gender. Actually, not at all. Because if you look at these numbers, you'll see in Department A, there were 825 male applicants, 62% admissions rate, only 108 women. So, and that's actually what's causing the paradox, or the unequal number of applicants in each department. Um, there was uh, one column that I wanted to point out, which is Department B, 560 male applicants, 25 females. Slightly higher rate on the females, but it's probably true, I don't know, that there was 25 brave female applicants to that department that had 560 male applicants in 1973. They were probably a lot better than the, the average male who applied. So yeah, maybe their admissions rate was slightly higher. Maybe it should have been 100%, you know, compared to the quality of the males. So it doesn't tell the whole story, but you can get this reversed effect. And I thought I'd actually explain this effect. I just think it's so fundamental. It's like the bullets on the airplane. And it comes up every election. It actually came up in the most recent election. Most people don't know this, so, or don't even realize it. Um, you know, there's kind of this meme out there that politicians are kind of stupid, ignorant, don't believe in truth, don't understand science. They're actually pretty smart about abusing the statistics, all right? Um, this is a great example. These are the voting rates for the Civil Rights Act. Um, and every election, the Republicans claim that they were for the Civil Rights Act while the Democrats opposed it. And it's actually true, right? So if you actually look by the House and Senate, these are the rates of, um, of yes votes uh, for the Civil Rights Act. You can imagine what I'm about to do now. I'm gonna break apart the data set for you. You go by north and south, that's the opposite, all right? So if you look at northern Democrats, northern Republicans, southern Democrats, southern Republicans, you'll see that 94% of northern Democrats voted for the Civil Rights Act versus 85% Republicans. In the south, 0% no Republicans voted. Um, actually, either the Senate or the House of Representatives, you had 0% of southern Republicans voting for the Civil Rights Act and a lot more Democrats in the North. Almost unanimous vote by the Democrats in the North. 
Um, so, you know, it's, uh, so the Democrats say that they were for the Civil Rights Act, and they're also telling the truth, okay? So uh, I don't think that the politicians are that stupid. They know exactly which table they're looking at. What's really going on here, it's exactly the same as with the admissions to Berkeley. Um, it's this sort of, uh, you know, this kind of um, imbalance in the, in the number of admissions that, that you see going on here. You can see that it's true that you know, very, you know, very few Southern Democrats actually voted for the Civil Rights Act. Basically, Southerners were not in favor of the Civil Rights Act. Um, but there were a lot more Northern uh, Democrats. Um, and the same in the Senate. You know, basically, almost nobody voted for the Civil Rights Act. So really, the right way to understand this data is it's not a Republican-Democrat split that's really going on here. It's a North-South split. You know, the Southerners are against it. The Northerners are for it. And in the North, um, there is a majority among Democrats. So, um, you know, it's a kind of, uh, uh, so I, I think these things are important to understand. And as educated citizens, before casting the stones at the politicians, we have to understand it ourselves. In case you're curious, uh, because, you know, what this paradox is actually, how, how it's working out this way, um, this is my favorite way to understand it. Um, what's really going on, you're calculating rates. And so these are the yes votes and these are the total votes. And, you know, the, the red uh, bar here uh, for the Southerners is, you know, there were like zero Republicans. And so what you see here is that when you split it by north-south, the slope of the blue line is higher than the slope of the red line. Here it's very slight but above zero, and here blue is above red. Because the slope, uh, if you remember from the calculus, is you know, yes votes divided by total votes. That's the slope. So the rate, the percent, is just the slope. And so what you have here is that you can have um, you know, two sets of votes, you know, the, this blue line and that blue line down here, that red line and that red line, and when you average them together, that means you add up the blue lines and you add up the red lines, then the red line is above, the, then the sum of the red is above the sum of the blue, even though the, the individual blues were above the red. So it's a little kind of geometry fooling. So that's what I wanted to talk about. I think selection bias is really important. Everything I said, you should basically ignore, uh, because I'm a privileged white male, my parents are scientists, I went to the best universities. So what do I know about your life or what you're going through? And I want to end by saying that I take no credit for my career except for one thing. So I was a grad student um, and I was in the math department. I was going to be a mathematician. And in mathematics, there's a very clear path. Uh, again, there was, this was being discussed earlier. Sort of an obvious, it might not be an easy path, but you become a postdoc and then you go and do another postdoc in math. That's certainly true, you do two postdocs often. Then you become a professor somewhere. And I'm pretty confident had I followed that path, I would be a professor today. Um, probably not at Berkeley. Um, it's not imposter syndrome. My pure mathematics is not the standards of UC Berkeley. But as a graduate student, I became interested in biology. And in mid-1990s, computational biology, which is what I work in today, was not on the map. Actually, neither was global warming. Um, uh, you know, for that matter, neither was sexual harassment on campuses. Basically, almost all the issues we talk about all the time today just weren't on the radar at all. It just wasn't called sexual harassment. It was definitely happening, but it wasn't the topic of discussion. Right. Yes. Um, and actually, you know, it, sort of when I think back, things that are discussed today, there's some global warming was probably happening also in the 90s, but nobody's talking about it. Um, I decided I would go and venture and work on biology but it was just not something anybody would do. And all the mentors I looked at, they weren't talking about that. They were not saying to do that. So the one thing I can take credit for is that I sort of, I do remember just thinking about the selection bias, that all the advice I was getting was good advice, but it just wasn't pertinent to what I wanted to do. And so I think it's very important as you sit in this room today, there's all these careers you could have, all these things you could do, and all these ways to become a professor if that's what you choose to. Um, should just think always about the selection bias. So I think I'll uh, stop with that. Thank you very much.